It is good to be here with you tonight. I am honored by the opportunity. It's always a, a highlight uh, of my year when I get an email from Richard and he wants to know, is there a date you can come uh, to Deerfoot? Uh, because I always enjoy being here. Every time I come, there seem to be more and more familiar faces. Some of them who pop up from the past and some uh, I've just gotten used to seeing you a little bit more, but that's a good thing and I'm grateful for that. It's always a pleasure to be able to spend some time with brothers and sisters in Christ. And I love the wonderful relationship that uh, Decatur Highway and uh, Deerfoot, Roebuck Parkway, going back a few years, uh, have always had. And I'm grateful for that and uh, I'm grateful for uh, Richard. Uh, Richard's family has meant a lot to me for a number of years. And I know he's doing a wonderful work over here and uh, that you guys love and appreciate him as well. I'll admit at one point uh, during the preparation process, I almost accused Richard of throwing me a curveball um, because he, he sent me the, the topic that he wanted me to deal with. And I understand it works into a theme that you guys are, are going through. But he sent me the topic and it's on the screen in front of you, living in the spirit with one another. I got to thinking about that from a preacher's standpoint. How do you tackle that particular topic? And I could have gone a couple of different ways. And so finally, not really knowing what he wanted me to do with it, uh, I, I messaged him and I said, okay, are you wanting me to talk about the Spirit or are you wanting me to talk about unity? And uh, I'm grateful he didn't send back yes and just leave it at that. <clears throat> That's more something I would have done. Um, but he did give me some clarity on what he was expecting from the lesson, and that helped me out a great deal, and I hope that we have uh, a, a wonderful time studying together tonight. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. That will be our text for the evening, and uh, we're going to notice some things about living in the Spirit. I heard a story a number of years ago about a lady <clears throat> who was uh, going to the grocery store, I believe, and, and she was backing out of her... Uh, garage. And as she began to back out of her garage, she did something that maybe you have done before. I know I've done it at least once or twice in my life. But she kind of got the, the accelerator and the brake mixed up. And so she pressed down hard on the accelerator and she shot down the driveway, uh, across the curb, over her neighbor's hedges, over her neighbor's garbage can, and right smack dab into her neighbor's garage door as well. And at that point, she said, she lost control. <laughs> Could be argued she lost control way before that. Uh, but sometimes that's the way we feel that our lives are going. We feel like we're all out of control. And in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, Paul actually describes a life out of control. We commonly refer to them as the, the works of the flesh. But notice what he says. He talks about people who have purity problems. He discusses adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, drunkenness, and reveling. And then he talks about people who have priority problems. He discusses idolatry and witchcraft. Then he talks about people who have uh, people problems. He speaks of hatred and variance and emulations and wrath and strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, and murder. My goodness, what a list. We can look around our world today, turn on the evening news, and you almost can see all of these things playing out. We live in a world out of control with people whose lives are out of control, and we have to sit and wonder, what in the world do you do? Now, just to make sure he didn't leave anything out, then Paul adds at the end of that, and such like. I've always kind of chuckled when I read that phrase, and such like, because at this point, after I read that long list of works of the flesh, my mind is, is just spiraling already. And then Paul says, but wait a minute, there may be more. There probably is more. And all of these things that people are doing to destroy their lives and destroy their spiritual life with God. The result, one writer said, is wasted time, weakened bodies, warped thinking, and wrecked lives. I think that's a pretty good description. That's what happens when people get caught up with the devil and they get tied into works of the flesh. 
And so we have to ask ourselves, what's the solution? How do we come out of that? How do we get our lives back under control? Well, in the very next verse, Paul says, but I've been teaching the book of Ephesians at Decatur Highway on Sunday mornings, and I love the book of Ephesians, and I'm not going to tear off into Ephesians right now because I'd be there for too long. But one of the things I love about Ephesians is the way that Paul divides Ephesians out. The first three chapters are very theological. The last three chapters are very practical. I also love the, the stark contrasts that Paul gives in the book. And the starkest contrast is in the early part of Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul describes us being dead in our trespasses and sins. And the condition that we are in without Jesus Christ and before we come to Jesus Christ. Then all of a sudden in, in verse 4, and I, I get excited when I, when I get to this. All of a sudden I get to verse 4 and he says, but God. And, and I sit back when I read that, when I study it, when I'm teaching it, and I think what would happen if there never was a but God? How different our lives would be, but God. Here in Galatians chapter 5, it's not so much but God, but in describing how our lives can get so messed up, so twisted, so out of order, so out of control, then he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. In essence, he does say, but God. But nonetheless, he's pointing us toward how we can get back in control, how we can gain control of all of these things. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness, faithfulness. And then look at those last two, meekness. Some of your translations may say gentleness, which is a word really that describes being under control, under the control of a master. And then temperance or self-control. And so all of this comes down to the fact that if we live one way, if we live for the world, if we live for the devil, if we live for the works of the flesh, then we're going to live a life out of control. That's going to be an absolute mess at every turn. Or we can allow the Spirit to change us. We can live in the Spirit. In the very uh, last verse, verse 25, he says, or not next to last verse, verse 25, he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And so for our time together tonight, I want to think about that idea of keeping in step with the Spirit. What does it mean to live a spiritual life? And you can get a lot of fanciful ideas. As a matter of fact, if you go to a bookstore and you go to the religious section, you're going to lead, read a, a lot of books that uh, they're going to tell you about spirituality. And I can boil them down for you very, very easily. Not that I've read all of them, but I've read enough of them to know what most people think of spirituality. And it boils down to what you feel. Well, I don't believe that's spirituality. I don't believe that's biblical spirituality. I think it's a little more solid than that. And so tonight we're going to think about uh, what spirituality is and how we can live that in our lives. And it will help us to live lives that are under control, living in the Spirit with one another. First thing I want us to notice is the standard of the Spirit. And let's think about this for a moment. How am I going to know if I'm out of control or if I'm in control? Who, who's going to decide that? Who's going to regulate that? How am I going to figure this out? Well, the standard is the law of God. Look, if you will, in uh, verse 13, Paul tells us, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We were called to freedom. Somebody spoke to us. Somebody said something to us. Somebody called us to freedom. Now the standard is law, the measurement is love. If we're going to follow the law of God, we must do it in a manner of love. But in the first verse of the chapter, Paul says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we're going to talk about that idea of freedom a little bit more here in just a few moments. In Romans chapter 8, Paul touches on the same idea and he says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That's the freedom that Paul is talking about. When the Bible says, love your neighbor, and we ask ourselves, do we love our neighbor? You say, well, that, 
has to do with how I feel about my neighbor. No, it really doesn't. Because you see, Paul also describes here in the book of Galatians that loving your neighbor is a law of God. You see, that's a regulation that God has given. And so we can tell whether or not we're living in the Spirit or not by how we love our neighbor. There's a standard that we can look at. Now, the problem is people treat law in a lot of different ways. There are at least three different ways uh, that men treat law or deal with law within their lives. One way is people will deal with law in their lives as an enemy. They, they don't like law. They don't want any law. And so what they want in their lives and what they expect in their lives is license. Our fleshly self does not want any restrictions. We don't want anybody tying us down. You know, we've learned that a little bit, and I think it's been developed here in the United States of America. We love our freedoms, and I'm certainly not speaking against our freedoms. I'm grateful for them, and I love them. But then, you know, when we went through a pandemic and people said, well, we've got to shut this down, we've got to shut this down, and we need to do things this way, and we need to do things that way. All of a sudden, we want to argue against all of those things, and no, 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 I'm a free American. I can do what I want to do. Did you hear that last phrase, I can do what I want to do? And so that's the way a lot of people think about law. They, they don't want anything restricting them. They don't want anything to fence them in. They don't want to be held down. And they, uh, somebody once said that following the path of least of resistance makes rivers and men crooked. Following the path of least resistance makes rivers and men crooked. But that's the way a lot of people uh, view law in their lives. The other way that people will view law is they'll view law as their master. First, an enemy. We don't want any law. Secondly, a master. And that's usually what we call legalism. Some people are trying to, to live under law and they're struggling and they're failing because their concept of law is they have to have a checklist for everything. You know, there's this huge list of do's and don'ts, and it's mostly don'ts. There's not a whole lot of do's. And if I, don't, uh, if I don't stay away from all of the bad things, then somehow I am an abject failure in my life. Let me tell you something. 10,000 don'ts will not make you one whit more like Jesus Christ. I don't care how many lists, how long a list of don'ts that you have. And you can remove yourself from all of the things that you say, well, this is contrary to Christ, this is contrary to Christ. I'm going to remove myself from that. Congratulations. But you're still not any more like Jesus Christ. You're going to have to have some do's in there. You're going to have to add some things. You're going to have to allow transformation to take place within your life. Christianity was never meant to be a legalistic a relationship. It is a relationship. And we need to understand the nature of that relationship. Some people live their lives full of, of negativism. Everything's bad. Everything's wrong. They're, they're looking for the next bad thing to happen. But that's not the way that God expected us to live. Notice again Galatians 5 and verse 1, for freedom Christ has set you free. And he goes on to say, therefore, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. That phrase, yoke of slavery, translates uh, in a couple of different ways. But one translation puts it this way, yoke of self-effort. If you're struggling in your Christianity because you're trying to make it on your own, that's the reason you're struggling. That's a primary reason you're struggling. Because Christianity was never meant to live, be lived alone. Now, the third way that we can deal with law is that we can deal with law as a friend. And that's what Paul describes here as liberty. A little exercise, we won't do it right here, right now, but I'll give you an exercise a little bit later. Read through Galatians chapter 5. Notice how many times Paul mentions freedom or liberty. I mean, it's a big emphasis here. He mentions it in uh, verse 1. He mentions it again in verse 13, not once but twice. And he wants us to know that we have freedom in Christ. Now, as I mentioned earlier, liberty does not mean you have the freedom to do whatever it is you want to do. No one is truly free to do whatever he wants to do. 
because that's not real freedom. Otherwise, uh, you, you trample over the freedoms of others. A, a, a pianist or, or, or a violinist, they can create beautiful music with those instruments, but only if they follow the rules of the instrument. You ever been to hear a symphony? You ever get there early enough and they're in their warm-up stage? And you've got the oboes and the clarinets and they're playing a different note and they're on a different tempo and then you've got the trumpets and the trombones and they're playing something different and it sounds like an absolute mess. But all of a sudden, when somebody stands in front of them with a little baton and waves it the right way, they all come together and they play a beautiful symphony. But they're following the rules. They're following the laws. And they're free to make beautiful music. The psalmist said in Psalm 119 and verse 54, Thy statutes have been songs in the house of my pilgrimage. When the Bible talks about liberty, again, it's not a freedom to do what you want to do, but it means that we are under the control of the Spirit and we are suddenly free to do what we ought to do. And there's a difference. We don't always want to do what we ought to do. But when we're being controlled by the Spirit of God, we are free to do what we ought to do. And that is what God really wants us to do within our lives. So we need to understand the standard uh, of, of our freedom. We need to understand the, the standard of the spiritual life. The second thing I want us to look at tonight is we need to look at the strength of the spiritual life. Again, going back to chapter 5 and verse 13, Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but through love serve one another. Again, notice the two times that he uses freedom. The Bible has a lot to say about lust. Sometimes that we preachers will, will talk about uh, lust and preach against lust. The word lust, or the word translated lust in our New Testament, really isn't a bad word. Did you know that? It's, it's really uh, sort of a, a neutral word. It just means a strong desire. Now you put it in the right context, and it can mean something very, very bad. Or you put it in another context, and it can mean something very, very good. But it's essentially talking about a strong desire. And though we've been born again, we still have desires of the flesh. Every single one of us has a civil war going on within us. Every single one of us has to deal with this on a constant and a daily basis. Paul put it this way in Romans 7 and verse 19. That which I would do, that do I not. That which I would not do, that do I. You ever deal with that? Things you know you ought to do, you don't do. Things you don't want to do, you find yourself doing. We get stuck with that sometimes. We battle that. Isn't it comforting at least a little bit to know that the Apostle Paul, of all people, dealt with the same problem. And he gives us some insight into how we can deal with that problem as well. But it is a problem, and it's one that is going to be constant with our lives. The, the things that we, uh, that we want to do are contrary, so that you may not do the things that you please. And you don't have to do what it takes uh, by self-effort uh, to do it. He does not say, do not fulfill the lust of the flesh and you will walk in the Spirit. He turns that around. And he turns it around on purpose. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, you're never going to get spiritual by just cutting things out of your life. You have to start by getting spiritual and then the Spirit will help to get things out of your life that don't need to be in your life. Holiness is not the way to Jesus. Jesus is the way to holiness. And that's the lesson that we need to learn. That's the track that we need to be on. So where do we get this strength? A little later in verse 18, Paul says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. That phrase, led by the Spirit, the, the Greek language, the original language of the New Testament there indicates that this is a, a willingness. We're willing to be led by the Spirit. Um, if you've ever been in a, a, a dark place, uh, maybe somewhere you've never been before, and somebody says, here, let me lead you by the hand. Let, let, me, let me show you the way. 
You're appreciative of that because you could stumble, you could fall, you could bump into something, you could hurt yourself. You're thankful that someone has led you, so you're willing to be led. You ever tried to take a two-year-old that didn't want to go somewhere and lead them? J.J. mentioned we have a granddaughter. She happens to be two years old. And uh, uh, there, there some days she's the sweetest girl in the world. I mean, she can, she can melt Papa's heart in a second. Sometimes she's as stubborn as she can be. And no matter what you do, no matter how you try to coax her, if she doesn't want to be led, you're not going to lead her. And we're a lot like that sometimes, even as adults. Especially when it comes to our spiritual lives. So how are we led by the Spirit? Well, turn with me, if you will, uh, back to Romans chapter 8. I want us to uh, jump into Romans 8 for just a minute because I think Galatians 5 and Romans 8 are two of the hallmark passages where Paul talks about being led by the Spirit and what it means to be led by the Spirit. If you look at the beginning of, verse, uh, of chapter 8, Paul says, There is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Sounds a lot, what we're talking, a lot like what we're talking about in Galatians 5, doesn't it? He's talking about freedom. He's talking about law. He's talking about uh, the, the flesh. He's talking about uh, spirituality. These are things that we need to be aware of. There are basically four things that Paul goes on to say here in Romans chapter 8 as to how we are led by the Spirit. The first way that he says we are led by the Spirit is by way of instruction. Look down at verse 5. He says, uh, well, verse 6. Let's jump to verse 6. He says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So you're either in the flesh or you're in the Spirit. Well, what's the difference? How you set your mind. And how do we set our minds? Well, we set our minds by what we've been taught, by how we've been instructed, by the things that we learn. Paul would say later in Romans chapter 12 uh, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but, be, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. God's interested in the way you think. God's so interested in the way that you think that he gave an entire book to tell us how we ought to think. And so instruction is the beginning of being led by the Spirit. The second word I want you to notice is influence. He says in verse 9, uh, you however are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. And he says in, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. That's funny, in the very next verse, he'll go on to say, but if Christ is in you. People get hung up on the fact that he says that, uh, in fact, if the Spirit of God does not dwell in you, then you are none of His. Well, in the very next verse, he says, if Christ is in you. So which is it? Is the Spirit in you or Christ is in you? Which is it that's in you? And I don't think it's an either or really kind of thing here. But I'm just pointing out, sometimes we get hung up on some of the things that we don't need to get hung up on. But what Paul is saying in essence here, as he talks about our relationship to the Spirit, is as the Christian thinks the way that the Spirit thinks, and he lives after the manner that the Spirit instructs, then that's the influence of the Spirit coming upon us. Again, uh, well, let me move to the next one, and then I'll talk about this. The next word that I want to give you is indwelling. There in verse 9, in fact, uh, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. You're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. You're in the Spirit. Christ is in you. All of these things are happening, and there's a relationship that is taking place. In context, what Paul means by this is his revealed thoughts continue to fill the Christian's heart and control the Christian's conduct. It goes back to that idea of being led by the Spirit and, and, and led by the revealed directives that the Spirit gives to us. In verse 15, he would talk about, uh, verses 15 to 17, he would talk about the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. So back and forth we go. 
We learn from the Spirit, He instructs us. We begin to think like and act like the Spirit wants us to think and act. And as we think and act like the Spirit wants us to act, we become transformed and changed to be more what the Spirit wants us to be. And that relationship builds that dwelling place that we have. That abiding in uh, the Spirit, abiding in what God wants us to be in so that we live the kind of life that we need to live. The fourth word we find later in verse 26, intercession. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And this is a complicated verse, and people have argued over exactly what this means. I think in context, this is my opinion, but in context, if we understand that the first three things that, that Paul talked about, instruction, influence, and indwelling, that those come by way of the instruction of the Spirit. Notice that word likewise. Likewise the Spirit helps. How does the Spirit help me? Interesting thing is, no matter what somebody's position is on what that verse means exactly, I haven't met anybody that can tell me exactly how the Spirit helps. <laughs> That's the interesting part of it. But we do know He helps. And he wants to help. And he's going to help. And so the Spirit intercedes. He comes alongside to help. And it just makes sense in the context that this is by way of revelation. Again, that's my opinion. But I want you to see these four words and how they work together. Now let's go back to Galatians chapter 5 just for a moment. In Galatians 5 and verse 16, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I've been instructed by the Spirit. I've been influenced by the Spirit. I'm indwelled by the Spirit. The Spirit's interceding for me. All of these things are taking place. How do I walk by the Spirit? Well, walking by the Spirit, number one, involves a commencement. You have to start that walk. There's an old phrase I heard a number of years ago. Perhaps you've heard it as well. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. I mean, there's just logic to that. It's just plain common sense to that. I don't care how long a journey you're going to take, it's going to begin with one step. And in our spiritual lives, as we think about living lives for Jesus Christ, we have to take that first step. I decide to do it, and then I, I engage an act of my will. There's that willingness that we talked about earlier. And so I engage my will and I actually do this thing. Now, ultimately it's not lived by willpower, but it is entered into on an act of the will. We have to decide this is the way that I'm going to live. I'm going to surrender myself to the instructions of the Spirit so that I can live a spiritual life. And here's the other thing, nobody can choose that for you. Nobody can force you to do that. You have to decide on your own. Every single living individual has to make the decision. I am going to walk in the Spirit. Not only is there the commencement, but there's the circumference of the walk as well. And the Spirit Himself is the circumference. And that goes back to Romans chapter 8, where we think about the instruction and the influence and the indwelling. If I say to you, let's take a walk in this building. How far are we going to go? Well, we're not going to go too far because we're going to stay in the building. You see, I've already noted the circumference, the, the outer boundaries of the walk that we're going to take. We're not going to go outside. We're not going to get in the rain. We're not going to walk through the wet grass. We're going to stay inside the building. We're going to take a walk in the building. And the Spirit of God is to be the environment of our lives. He is to be the environment of our walk. If we close ourselves off to the Spirit of God, then we simply cannot walk in the Spirit. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to open up to Him? Now the flesh is going to tell us. That fleshly side, you know, going back to Paul's, uh, that which I would do, that do I not, that which I would not do, that do I what the flesh is going to say is don't let him put that on you. Don't let God restrict you. You know how I know that? You go back to Genesis chapter 3. You remember when the serpent came into the garden, uh, Satan in the form of a serpent, and he first starts talking to the woman. 
His first suggestion was that God was restrictive in what he told them to do with that tree. And that's what he's been telling mankind ever since then. That's the lie that he wants us to believe, that God is not looking out for us, and God wants to restrict us from the better things of life, things that we would really enjoy. The flesh says that there are things you need to have, you need to experience outside of Christianity, outside of the Spirit, outside of a relationship with God. And if you don't experience those things, you'll never have a full life. The Greek word for that is balone. <laughs> but that's what the Spirit is going to, that's what the devil is going to tell you. Every single time he's going to tell you, you need something more. But you see, the spiritual life says there is nothing worth having outside of Christ. There's nothing out there beyond Jesus that is worth having. And that's what the spiritual mind builds into us. There's also the continuance of the walk. As I mentioned, the, the original language uh, talks about uh, a willingness. But here in verse 16, it's not just walk by the Spirit, take you know, a few steps and stop. But it's a continual thing that's going on. We need to continue to walk in the Spirit. Just as walking is a series of steps. You know, if I say, take a step in my direction, well, you, okay, you can take one step. But if I tell you to walk toward me, you're going to take a series of steps, right? It's going to involve more than one step. And the same thing is true in our walk for God. It's going to involve a series of steps as we continue to progress in our spiritual lives. Colossians 2 and verse 6 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ? Do you remember? Can you think back? Do you remember what struck you? Uh, what dawned on you? What, what realization you came to and you said, I need Jesus. I need to put him on in baptism. Do you remember? It's a good exercise for all of us sometimes to sit down and just remember. I've recommended for a number of years, especially when I'm dealing with younger folks, probably not a bad idea for older folks because the older I get, the more things I realize I forget. So <laughs> probably not a bad exercise for everybody, but especially for younger folks who come to me and they say, I want to be baptized. I'll ask them why. Simple question, but I think it's an important one. Why do you want to be baptized? And then they'll begin to explain to me what their thinking is and what's going on in their mind. And what I recommend to them is, I said, as soon as you get home, quickest chance you have, I want you to get a piece of paper and a pen. I want you to write that down. Because there's going to come a day when you're going to sit and you're going to wonder, now I don't remember why I did what I did. I, 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 don't, I don't know what I was thinking when I did this. And if you have it written down, you can say, oh, wait a minute, over here in my, in, in my desk or, or stuffed in a book or in a box or whatever it is. If you had a mother like mine, you've got a box. I know you do. Um, but maybe stuck somewhere in all that memorabilia and you pull that piece of paper out. And you start to read the simple, clear words of a child's mind, if not a child in body, a child in the spirit, a child in Christ, who at that moment knew exactly why they were doing what they were doing. And what a powerful reminder that can be. As you came to Christ, as you received Christ, so walk in Him. You take those same steps. It's not complicated. You know, the writer of the book of Hebrews talks about the elementary things and that we need to go on to maturity, but he never says leave the elementary behind because if in almost any field you'll notice that the more complex things that you deal with, they're basically complexities of the beginning things that you learned, the, the elementary things. 
And so as we grow in our spiritual lives, we don't ever leave those elementary things behind. Because sometimes we're going to need to go back to them. Every good football coach I've ever known, they start off, I remember the story about the great Vince Lombardi. They said the first uh, practice that he had with the Green Bay Packers as their head coach, he walked into practice and he held up a football and he says, men, this is a football. It's getting back to basics. Sometimes that's what we need to do in our spiritual lives. We need to remember what brought us to Christ in the first place and do the first things. Just repeat them. Keep going over them. And that'll help us in our walk. One final thought, and I know my time's about up. But I want us to think about the satisfaction of the spiritual life. Because after Paul goes through that litany of all the works of the flesh, he then turns and says, but the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you to think about that terminology, the fruit of the Spirit is. Now, one thing, and, and this is a bugaboo of mine, and I know it, 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 it may not mean anything to anybody else. But this is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. The word there is singular. It's it's not multifaceted uh, or it's not multiple fruits. It may be a multifaceted fruit, but it's not multiple fruits. There's only one fruit of the Spirit. There's only one. And we need to think of it in that way. Now, it's made up of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and and faithfulness, and and, um, gentleness, and self-control. All of those things. I understand that. But it's one fruit. And Paul says it is a fruit. The devil says you don't have to live that way. Well, how many of you would like to live without food? How many of you would like to live without the foods that you like? I've told people before, if I ever get to a point where a doctor or somebody else says that I can't eat chocolate or I can't eat uh, banana pudding, just go ahead and have my funeral. I'm done. Uh, You know, there's some things I just don't want to do without. Some things I've done without because over the last two or three years, I needed to lose some weight. Boy, I guess, I don't know if it was the pandemic or what it was, or just my love of eating, but I needed to lose some weight. Thank God I have. But, uh, so there's some things I had to do without, but I still want those things. I still desire those things. You know, I still get up every morning and I still eat breakfast. And about noon, I'm, I'm wanting something to eat at, at, at lunch. May not be the same thing I used to eat. May not be as much as I used to eat, but I want to eat something. And then when it comes supper time, I'm ready for supper as well. Nobody wants to live a life without sustenance. The fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is luscious. Fruit is, fruit is, uh, is beautiful. Fruit is fragrant. But most of all, fruit is satisfying. And I think that's what we need to think of when we think of the fruit of the Spirit here. Something that satisfies our spirit. And it's meant to be consumed. It's meant to to feed our hunger. Jesus says we're to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Do you have a hunger hunger for God? Do you have a hunger for love? Do you have a hunger for joy? Do you have a hunger for peace? Do you have a hunger for patience or kindness or goodness or faithfulness? Do you have a hunger for for gentleness and self-control? Do you have a hunger for that? Well, good news is God has fruit for that. And God knows how to satisfy He knows how to give us exactly what we need. In uh, verse 24 uh, of, uh, and I got to preaching and forgot what was on the screen. But in verse 24 and 25, notice Paul's words. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. There's that word desires. Strong desires. If we live by the Spirit. Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we're going to win that civil war of the soul, that civil war that goes on in each and every one of us, if we're going to overcome all of those temptations that the devil's going to put in our way and try to lead us away from Christ, if we are going to live a life controlled by the Spirit, then we're going to have to keep in step with the Spirit. We're going to have to continue to walk in Him. I like what one writer said concerning this. 
He said, no one is freer than the one living the life of the Spirit controlled by the power of Jesus Christ. And I believe that to firmly to be true. No one is freer than the one living the life of the Spirit controlled by the power of Jesus Christ. And I hope and I pray that every one of us tonight, if you're not living under that kind of control, that you'll start tonight and you'll let go to the Spirit of God. Let Him transform your life and the way that you walk. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for every blessing that you give us in life. We're thankful for the privilege that we have to be your people. We're thankful that you were thoughtful enough of us to reveal your mind, your heart to us, that we can understand the ways of the Spirit. And being guided by the ways of the Spirit, that we can live the life of the Spirit every single day of our lives. And when the devil tries to come in and, and take us away, when he tries to deceive us and, and tempt us, by the little things that will draw us away from you, that we can look to you and we can cling to the things that you have revealed to us and we can take another step, another uh, walk, another journey in your direction and so live by the Spirit. Father, we pray that as we live our lives, we will live lives that are honoring and glorifying to you and that the fruit of the Spirit will be seen within each and every one of us. We're thankful for this good church. Pray your rich blessings on it. We're thankful for uh, Richard and for JJ and all those who work with the church here and pray your blessings on them. And Father, as we all represent your kingdom, may we do so in such a way that will draw others closer to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks.